when we talk about soil to soul, you know, we're talking about actually viscerally participating in this soil building procedure, which then is soul worthy. It satiates your deepest needs for survival and your deepest needs for nobility and sacredness and vocation. And that's a powerful meeting of two very important physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional needs. I'm Joel Salatin. Our family owns Polyface Farm here in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. Polyface, the farm of many faces. Dad used to say, we're not just two-faced, we're many-faced. So we have all you know, different animals, different services, different, uh, different projects we're doing, and it's all about, uh, like a polyculture, the farm of many faces. You know, Dad had a dream of farming. He never made a living farming. He was an accountant, but he was wearing a sharp pencil. And he realized early on that the whole chemical approach was like a drug addiction, you know, you could never get ahead of it. So we looked at nature as a template. And how does nature build soil? How does nature create fertility? How does nature create abundance? And so that became our template then, you know, from then to now. Several years ago, you know, I, I decided to just have fun with all the pushback that I actually get from different kinds of people. They, they, they want you to sign on to their box, you know, they, they've got this box and they want you to sign on to their box. I got tired of trying to be put in different kinds of boxes, so I finally said I'm a, I'm a Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic farmer. Don't put me in a box. I'll, I'll sound like a, like a raving socialist one minute and I'll sound like a libertarian the next minute. Well, we're just walking up to the cows. They were, they were here, so they were here yesterday. So we move the cows every day from paddock to paddock. So as they finish one, then they go to another one. And so we, we confine the cows to as small an area as necessary to feed them for one day. So here you can see, you can see if you go right up this electric fence here, you can see here where they were yesterday and then over here where they are today. So this electric fence uh, uh, defines how much they're able to have in a day. Now what's interesting is when they eat, when they pull this off, prune that and eat it, the plant, the plant prunes off underground the same amount of biomass the pruning above the ground creates identical pruning below the ground. We call this pulsing the pasture. And that's literally like pumping, it's like pumping carbon. This is what we call it about uh, carbon sequestration. This, this right here is sunlight. They jettison material into the soil like a heartbeat and that's pumping that organic matter and carbon into the soil, which is the way then the soil actually you know, uh, which then feeds the actinomycetes and the mycelium and the gibberellins and, you know, all azotobacter and all of the, the, the soil life that is, that is actually more beings per handful of soil than there are people on the face of the earth. So there's a, there's a whole underground community. I call it an underground cafe going on. All this, this, this soil, bacteria, nematodes, protozoa, all that biology, earthworms, you know. Healthy soil is actually more space than stuff. Um, I call it cathedral soil. You know, you walk into a cathedral and what's amazing about a cathedral is, is, is yes, the, the skeleton and the structure but what's amazing about it is the space. The healthier a soil is, the more space there is to, to hold oxygen and water 
and, and to allow space for all this biology to live, to work, to trade, to, to, to uh, commute. And the spaces are from all this biomass that creates um, humus and structure within the soil that creates more air spaces and more porosity. The role of an herbivore is that as this, as this, uh, as this grass, as this plant grows, as this plant grows, it finally stops growing. It only grows so big, and so it enters senescence. So I call this diaper grass, teenage grass, nursing home grass. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna capture as much solar energy as possible into biomass, we want it in this teenage stage. So nature does this with herbivores. So as the forage approaches, uh, approaches um, senescence, the herbivore comes along. It prunes that forage to restart this rapid juvenile growth curve. So, so the idea of, of pruning is what the herbivore is for. I can show you this. Look at this right here. This is amazing. <clears throat> this grass plant was grazed 24 hours ago. You can sh see the sheath right there where they bit it off. And so if the cows stayed on here for a couple of days, this is going to get up this long. Well, then they're going to eat it off again. Well, it hasn't replaced the energy in the soil that was expended in sending forth the new shoot by that time. But with this little electric fence, we can, we can roll this out and put, and we can, we can literally put a, a steering wheel, a brake, and an accelerator on that four-legged pruner and steer them around the landscape and say, you can have this plant today, but you have to wait till tomorrow to have that one. And you have to wait till the next day to have that one. And we can literally, we can literally mow across, we can prune across the landscape. So what we want to do is protect these new little tender shoots from, from an early pruning. So in nature, predators, flies, monsoon rains, all these things move herds across the landscape so they don't stay in the same place. There is a design, there is a, there is a master plan here that works and it's incumbent on us not to adulterate it or to disrespect it, but to actually you know, respect it, leverage it, appreciate it, use technology to actually massage and caress this natural capacity of the biomass, the interaction of the herbivore, the pruning, to tap into the abundance of nature. One of the, the, the beauties of the herbivore in this respect is they can take marginal land and they can upgrade it to nutritional density for us. And, uh, and so they can take places that would be, you know, too distant, too steep, too rocky, too whatever, to garden uh, or, or to, you know, or even to live on very well. And, um, and they can turn this into incredible human nutrition. So we're going to go over here and talk about our composting program and that's how we really build soil. So when we run out of grass in the winter, start feeding hay, we feed through these, uh, these boxes here and, um, and these boxes are on pulleys with a hand winch at the end, we can just raise them up. And the idea is those cows are dropping 50 pounds of goodies out their back end every day. We load carbon, we call it a carbonaceous diaper, into this floor to absorb the nutrients and we just let it build, build, and as it, as it builds, 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 we just keep cranking up this, uh, this hay gate so it, it'll get in here, you know, four feet deep. And, um, and then as we build it, we add corn to it. Corn uh, ferments because the cows are heavy, they're tromping out the, uh, the oxygen 
and it's it's anaerobic so it's fermenting in there we add corn to it the corn then ferments in that bedding pack when the cows come out in the spring and begin grazing we put the pigs in and the pigs then churn this all up and turn it seeking the fermented corn in the bedding and convert it from anaerobic to aerobic compost so this whole thing which has become which has been the diaper in the winter becomes the compost program in the spring and then of course when the pigs are done then we spread it out on the fields and that is that is the heart and soul that is truly the heart and soul of our farm of polyphase This isn't, this isn't from winter, but, uh, but you can see, mm, that just smells like, smells like uh, humus, like, uh, you know, rotty leaves. And it's primarily, you know, wood chips and manure. And, um, and there's, there's no, there's zero manure odor. And so the, the volatile and soluble nutrients have been tied up in the carbon. You can see you can see the little the little bugs and critters. You know, there's all sorts of little uh, worms and roly polies and centipedes and different things. You know, there's a there's a red wiggler worm. This is this is full of life. So this is the life that's in the soil. Let's, let's come around here. So this is a pig pasture. It's actually a kind of a silvo pasture, widely spaced uh, trees and, um, and the, the grass underneath kind of called a silvo pasture. And so this is the way we handle pigs. And if you, look, if you look down there, you can see the paddocks that they vacated a week ago. They're coming back nicely with you know, new green grass. The one that they're in, they have obviously you know, eaten the grass. And then, and then this one here, which is ready to receive them in the next day or two. Obviously, you know, it's all grown up high with grass. And we touch each of these paddocks just um, three times, three times a year because it is pretty disturbing. So there's a, there's a long rest period and then a short, you know, impact period. But because of the ways, the, the, the way the pigs impact it, you know, they actually they actually eat a lot of the grass. They certainly do uh, uh, do some some disturbance and some tillage, and uh, and that stimulates new you know new seeds to germinate. And of course, you know we have the self feeder here, so they're you know they're on their own uh, feeder, and uh, they have their water. We have a water line that runs down along the edge, so they get their water. We've been running this pig pasture again. This is this is mountain. I mean, it's rocky. It's you know very little soil, but um, but gradually the pigs are, are, you know, have been building soil. We've been running this one for about 20 years. The pigs actually root up a berm under the electric fences. So this becomes like a rice paddy as an erosion control. And the pigs do all that work. We don't do any of that. They just do it over time. And that stabilizes the area so that even though we are, you know, impacting it with the pigs, um, the soil, any silt, anything, you know, is held up is held up uh, where it is. And the paddocks are small, you know, they're just uh, half acre paddocks. But we don't wanna just raise, you know, bacon and pork chops. We wanna see if there's a way to use an animal to use the talents of the pig, uh, like we do with the composting. And then out here, we're doing it here in a, in a conversion of a, you know, of, a, of otherwise a, a sterile forest into a dynamic silvo pasture, the pigs are the, are the tool. Um, so if you look right beyond them, 20 years ago, I cut, this, I cut this area as forest. Beyond them, that's what it would have looked like without pigs, but with pigs, this is what it looks like. So it's not one's terrible and one's good, it's just, it's just uh, a diversity and a mosaic and so the impact of the pigs and the, using the pigs as a management tool actually creates a more dynamic mosaic on the ecosystem than just if it were just you know left sterile and static with no exercise we call this 
ecological exercise. The soil, the soil needs to be exercised just like us. We don't want couch potato soil. We want exercise soil. And so the periodic disturbance actually awakens seeds in the seed bank, different kinds of species. And of course the pigs are dropping manure and up here in the woods that attracts wild turkeys and all sorts of things are attracted in here uh, as a result of the pigs being here. So this actually stimulates wildlife as opposed to competing with wildlife. It creates these little silvo pastures in an otherwise you know, fairly uh, uh, sterile ecology. The pigs then, instead of just being bacon and pork, they become co-laborers and fellow team players in this great land healing ministry. And that really changes the, the, the mental, emotional, spiritual relationship we have with the animals, that they're not just pounds of stuff, they're actually fellow caressers and, and, and exercisers and managers in the, you know, in the greater ecosystem. And that, again, that brings this from just doing something to doing something noble and sacred. So this is the Millennium Feathernet, and yes, it is named for the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars because it's big and it can go anywhere really, really well. There's a thousand layers here, so these are, these are laying chickens as opposed to the meat chickens. This netting here is uh, space age stuff. Yeah, I, I turned off the energizer. Here's a little solar energizer, and you turn it off and on, ground rod, and that energizes this, but it has a, it has a stainless steel thread woven through it to, to put spark on it to keep the chickens in and coyotes and foxes out. And so this is really high tech uh, material here that, that comes in uh, 50, meter, 50 meter rolls and uh, we can take it up and put it down. So these guys get moved every three days. They get a quarter acre and we just move them along the field. So they were just, they were just over here. You can see the old circle here and then we move them up here. So what you have is, is you have contiguous circles and you have the birds in here and then you make a contiguous one, you open it up, you pull everything through, the chickens just walk through into the next circle, you close it and then you take this one down, put it up here and you just you know, leap through, leapfrog through the, through the field. As opposed to a, a confinement chicken factory, these birds are getting exercise they're out on the ground they are scratching and pecking and they are doing things with the soil that are highly interactive so you're bringing you're bringing consciousness if you will you're bringing consciousness to the soil with all these animals being out on pastures that are confined in in structures you're bringing their instinct their desire and their innate uh, uh, capacity you know their their physical and and, and social um, interactions you're bringing those actually right to the soil and uh and again that creates this this whole um ecology of of diversity and um and exercise you know within the system so they you know, of course they lay up in the boxes and have roosts in there this is on skids it's not on it's not on tires it's on skids and we just pull it right along the field We direct market everything, so we don't sell into somebody else's brand. So we have our own, you know, branded polyface here in the farm store, along with other neighbors, other people in the area that are food crafters and artisan fiber and food workers. So we can create a, a destination location here on the farm for people to come and basically live, you know, out of our farm store. We also service about 30 urban neighborhood drop points that order online and we service them once a month. We deliver to those within roughly a four hour radius of us. And then we ship, uh, we ship nationwide in the continental US.
this is pastured broilers, polyface style, kind of our, our centerpiece and one of the things that we're most known for. So normally you think of, of commercial poultry production, you think of a, you know, a big confinement house, thousands of birds in it. Here we have little, little field shelters. They don't have a floor in them. We move them every morning to a fresh spot. The chickens just walk on the, on the ground like that to the next spot. So they get a clean place of, of bedding. Uh, they get a fresh salad bar, a new set of bugs, and they leave all their manure right on the ground where it fertilizes the soil and the soil can come right up uh, through it. So every day they just get moved right along the pasture. So one person with that little dolly, one person without starting an engine can move 4,500 chickens in 60 minutes. The, the beauty of this is you don't have to own the land in order to run your farm infrastructure on it. So the mobile infrastructure is a game changer. Number two, it's modular. We have about 200 of these. So we actually have an equivalent roof space as like a, you know, a, a confinement factory house, but they're in modules. They're in little modules that we built over many years, over time. So with no debt here with modules, if you want to, if you wanted to raise chickens for a regular commercial, you know, uh, uh, production deal, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to uh, borrow half a million dollars and build this great big house. Here, all you have to do is cancel your Netflix subscription for a couple of months, and with pocket change, you build one of these, and you're in the chicken business. And if you like it, you can build a second one. If you like it, you can build a third one. And if you're as crazy as we are, you can build 200 of them. But by being built over time, you can cash flow it and capitalize your venture without debt. That's a game changer, okay? So we've got mobile, we've got modular, and finally, management intensive. And what that means is that it takes people to run this. So this is where, of course, the, you know, the, the detractors say, I, I knew there was a catch to this. This would take more farmers, and they say it with a bit of condescension and derision as if I can't imagine a worse a worse thing for a sophisticated techno glitzy culture like ours than to have more farmers but I would suggest that we have traded more farmers we have traded it for energy intensity pharmaceutical intensity and capital intensity and I would suggest that, that that moves our equity from stuff to skill, practical knowledge, and relationships. And I'll take that equity any time of day because there's not a banker in the world that can foreclose on your skill or foreclose on your relationships. When we have a complex soil structure, and a complex plant structure, these chickens are eating this salad, if you will. And the, the thing is that our microbiome is extremely complex. It has whatever, you know, trillions of, of uh, bacteria in it. And these bacteria need diversity. They need, they need diversity as well. And so by having these chickens out on the soil as part of this soil community and the vegetation it's producing, those chickens get nuance of dandelion, nuance of narrow leaf plant, nuance of clover. So then our gut, the bacteria that wants nuance of dandelion, nuance of narrow leaf plantain, and nuance of clover, it feeds our gut bacteria so it becomes more complex. And as our gut bacteria becomes more co complex, then it actually creates more balance and more vitality, which then feeds our mental acuity, mental capacity, emotional stability. And that's where we get this soil all the way through, all the way to our whole soul, our whole being. We are absolutely connected with this ecological umbilical. And it's, it's quite profound. And uh, it's something that it would behoove us to understand how to appreciate, respect, and honor producing our food, connecting our food with 
the soil, and our own soul.